Chapter 10 of The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. Chapter 10. Days and days went by now, and no Satan. It was dull without him, but the astrologer, who had returned from his excursion to the moon, went about the village, braving public opinion, and getting a stone in the middle of his back now and then, when some witch-hater got a safe chance to throw it and dodge out of sight. Meantime, two influences had been working well for Margaret. That Satan, who was quite indifferent to her, had stopped going to her house after a visit or two, had hurt her pride, and she had set herself the task of banishing him from her heart. Reports of Wilhelm Meidling's dissipation, brought to her from time to time by old Ursula, had touched her with remorse, jealousy of Satan being the cause of it, and so, now, these two matters working upon her together, she was getting a good profit out of the combination. Her interest in Satan was steadily cooling, her interest in Wilhelm as steadily warming. All that was needed to complete her conversion was that Wilhelm should brace up and do something that should cause favorable talk and incline the public toward him again. The opportunity came now. Margaret sent and asked him to defend her uncle in the approaching trial, and he was greatly pleased, and stopped drinking and began his preparations with diligence, with more diligence than hope, in fact, for it was not a promising case. He had many interviews in his office with Seppi and me, and threshed out our testimony pretty thoroughly, thinking to find some valuable grains among the chaff, but the harvest was poor, of course." if satan would only come that was my constant thought he could invent some way to win the case for he had said it would be won so he necessarily knew how it could be done but the days dragged on and still he did not come of course i did not doubt that it would be won and that father peter would be happy for the rest of his life since satan had said so Yet I knew I should be much more comfortable if he would come and tell us how to manage it. It was getting high time for Father Peter to have a saving change toward happiness, for by general report he was worn out with his imprisonment and the ignominy that was burdening him, and was like to die of his miseries unless he got relief soon. At last the trial came on, and the people gathered from all around to witness it, among them many strangers from considerable distances. Yes, everybody was there, except the accused. He was too feeble in body for the strain. But Margaret was present, and keeping up her hope and her spirit the best she could. The money was present, too. It was emptied on the table, and was handled and caressed and examined by such as were privileged. The astrologer was put in the witness-box. He had on his best hat and robe for the occasion. Question. You claim that this money is yours? Answer. I do. How did you come by it? I found the bag in the road when I was returning from a journey. When? More than two years ago. What did you do with it? I brought it home and hid it in a secret place in my observatory, intending to find the owner if I could. You endeavored to find him? I made diligent inquiry during several months, but nothing came of it. And then? I thought it not worth while to look further, and was minded to use the money in finishing the wing of the foundling asylum connected with the priory and nunnery so I took it out of its hiding-place, and counted it to see if any of it was missing, and then, why do you stop? Proceed. I am sorry to have to say this, but just as I had finished and was restoring the bag to its place, I looked up, and there stood Father Peter behind me. Several murmured, that looks bad, but others answered, ah, but he is such a liar. That made you uneasy? No. I thought nothing of it at the time, for Father Peter often came to me, unannounced, to ask for a little help in his need. 
Margaret blushed crimson at hearing her uncle falsely and impudently charged with begging, especially from one he had always denounced as a fraud, and was going to speak, but remembered herself in time and held her peace. Proceed. In the end I was afraid to contribute the money to the foundling asylum, but elected to wait yet another year and continue my inquiries. When I heard of Father Peter's find I was glad, and no suspicion entered my mind. When I came home a day or two later and discovered that my own money was gone, I still did not suspect until three circumstances connected with Father Peter's good fortune struck me as being singular coincidences. Pray, name them. Father Peter had found his money in a path. I had found mine in a road. Father Peter's find consisted exclusively of gold ducats. Mine also. Father Peter found eleven hundred and seven ducats. I exactly the same. This closed his evidence, and certainly it made a strong impression on the house. One could see that. Wilhelm Meidling asked him some questions, then called us boys, and we told our tale. It made the people laugh, and we were ashamed. We were feeling pretty badly, anyhow, because Wilhelm was hopeless and showed it. He was doing as well as he could, poor young fellow, but nothing was in his favor, and such sympathy as there was was now plainly not with his client. It might be difficult for court and people to believe the astrologer's story, considering his character, but it was almost impossible to believe Father Peter's. We were already feeling badly enough but when the astrologer's lawyer said he believed he would not ask us any questions, for our story was a little delicate, and it would be cruel for him to put any strain upon it, everybody tittered, and it was almost more than we could bear. Then he made a sarcastic little speech, and got so much fun out of our tale, and it seemed so ridiculous and childish, and every way impossible and foolish, that it made everybody laugh till the tears came. And at last Margaret could not keep up her courage any longer, but broke down and cried, and I was so sorry for her. Now I noticed something that braced me up. It was Satan standing alongside of Wilhelm, and there was such a contrast. Satan looked so confident, had such a spirit in his eyes and face, and Wilhelm looked so depressed and despondent. We two were comfortable now, and judged that he would testify and persuade the bench and the people that black was white and white black, or any other color he wanted it. We glanced around to see what the strangers in the house thought of him, for he was beautiful, you know, stunning, in fact, but no one was noticing him, so we knew by that that he was invisible. The lawyer was saying his last words, and while he was saying them, Satan began to melt into Wilhelm. He melted into him and disappeared, and then there was a change when his spirit began to look out of Wilhelm's eyes. That lawyer finished quite seriously and with dignity. He pointed to the money and said, The love of it is the root of all evil. There it lies, the ancient tempter, newly red with the shame of its latest victory, the dishonor of a priest of God and his two poor juvenile helpers in crime. If it could but speak... Let us hope that it would be constrained to confess that, of all its conquests, this was the basest and the most pathetic. He sat down. Wilhelm rose and said, From the testimony of the accuser, I gather that he found this money in a road more than two years ago. Correct me, sir, if I misunderstood you. The astrologer said his understanding of it was correct and the money so found was never out of his hands, thenceforth up to a certain definite date, the last day of last year. Correct me, sir, if I am wrong. The astrologer nodded his head. Wilhelm turned to the bench and said, If I prove that this money here was not that money, then it is not his? Certainly not, but this is irregular. If you had such a witness, it was your duty to give proper notice of it and have him here to— he broke off and began to consult with the other judges. 
Meantime, that other lawyer got up excited and began to protest against allowing new witnesses to be brought into the case at this late stage. The judges decided that his contention was just and must be allowed. But this is not a new witness, said Wilhelm. It has already been partly examined. I speak of the coin. The coin? What can the coin say? It can say it is not the coin that the astrologer once possessed. It can say it was not in existence last December. By its date it can say this. And it was so. There was the greatest excitement in the court while that lawyer and the judges were reaching for coins and examining them and exclaiming, and everybody was full of admiration of Wilhelm's brightness in happening to think of that neat idea. At last order was called, and the court said, All of the coins but four are of the date of the present year. The court tenders its sincere sympathy to the accused, and its deep regret that he, an innocent man, through an unfortunate mistake, has suffered the undeserved humiliation of imprisonment and trial. The case is dismissed. So the money could speak after all, though that lawyer thought it couldn't. The court rose, and almost everybody came forward to shake hands with Margaret and congratulate her, and then to shake with Wilhelm and praise him. And Satan had stepped out of Wilhelm and was standing around looking on, full of interest, and people walking through him every which way, not knowing he was there. And Wilhelm could not explain why he only thought of the date on the coins at the last moment instead of earlier. He said it just occurred to him all of a sudden, like an inspiration, and he brought it right out without any hesitation, for although he didn't examine the coins, he seemed somehow to know it was true. That was honest of him, and like him. Another would have pretended he had thought of it earlier and was keeping it back for a surprise. He had dulled down a little now, not much, but still you could notice that he hadn't that luminous look in his eyes that he had while Satan was in him. He nearly got it back, though, for a moment, when Margaret came and praised him and thanked him, and couldn't keep him from seeing how proud she was of him. The astrologer went off dissatisfied and cursing, and Solomon Isaacs gathered up the money and carried it away. It was Father Peter's for good and all now. Satan was gone. I judged that he had spirited himself away to the jail to tell the prisoner the news, and in this I was right. Margaret and the rest of us hurried thither at our best speed, in a great state of rejoicing. Well, what Satan had done was this. He had appeared before that poor prisoner, exclaiming, The trial is over, and you stand forever disgraced as a thief, by verdict of the court. The shock unseated the old man's reason. When we arrived ten minutes later, he was parading pompously up and down, and delivering commands to this and that and the other constable or jailer, and calling them Grand Chamberlain and Prince this and Prince that, and Admiral of the Fleet, Field Marshal in command, and such fustian, and was as happy as a bird. He thought he was emperor." Margaret flung herself on his breast and cried, and indeed everybody was moved almost to heartbreak. He recognized Margaret, but could not understand why she should cry. He patted her on the shoulder and said, "'Don't do it, dear. Remember there are witnesses, and it is not becoming in the crown princess. Tell me your trouble. It shall be mended. There is nothing the emperor cannot do.' Then he looked around and saw old Ursula with her apron to her eyes. He was puzzled at that, and said, "'And what is the matter with you?' Through her sobs she got out words, explaining that she was distressed to see him so. He reflected over that a moment, then muttered as if to himself, "'A singular thing, the dowager duchess. Means well, but is always snuffling, and never able to tell what it is about. It is because she doesn't know.' His eyes fell on Wilhelm. "'Prince of India,' he said, "'I divine that it is you that the crown princess is concerned about. "'Her tears shall be dried. "'I will no longer stand between you. "'She shall share your throne, and between you you shall inherit mine. "'There, little lady, have I done well. "'You can smile now, isn't it so?' 
He petted Margaret and kissed her, and was so contented with himself and with everybody that he could not do enough for us all, but began to give away kingdoms and such right and left, and the least that any of us got was a principality. And so, at last, being persuaded to go home, he marched in an imposing state, and when the crowds along the way saw how it gratified him to be hurrahed at, they humored him to the top of his desire, and he responded with condescending bows and gracious smiles, and often stretched out a hand and said, Bless you, my people, as pitiful a sight as ever I saw. And Margaret and old Ursula crying all the way. On my road home I came upon Satan and reproached him with deceiving me with that lie. He was not embarrassed, but said quite simply and composedly, Ah, you mistake. It was the truth. I said he would be happy the rest of his days, and he will, for he will always think he is the emperor, and his pride in it and his joy in it will endure to the end. He is now, and will remain, the one utterly happy person in this empire. But the method of it, Satan, the method! Couldn't you have done it without depriving him of his reason? It was difficult to irritate Satan, but that accomplished it. What an ass you are, he said. Are you so unobservant as not to have found out that sanity and happiness are an impossible combination? No sane man can be happy, for to him life is real, and he sees what a fearful thing it is. Only the mad can be happy, and not many of those. The few that imagine themselves kings or gods are happy. The rest are no happier than the sane. Of course, no man is entirely in his right mind at any time, but I have been referring to the extreme cases. I have taken from this man that trumpery thing which the race regards as a mind. I have replaced his tin life with a silver gilt fiction. You see the result, and you criticize. I said I would make him permanently happy, and I have done it. I have made him happy, by the only means possible to his race. And you are not satisfied. He heaved a discouraged sigh and said, It seems to me that this race is hard to please. There it was, you see. He didn't seem to know any way to do a person a favor, except by killing him or making a lunatic out of him. I apologized as well as I could, but privately I did not think much of his processes at that time. Satan was accustomed to say that our race lived a life of continuous and uninterrupted self-deception. It duped itself from cradle to grave with shams and delusions which it mistook for realities, and this made its entire life a sham. Of the score of fine qualities which it imagined it had and was vain of, it really possessed hardly one. It regarded itself as gold and was only brass. One day when he was in this vein he mentioned a detail, the sense of humor. I cheered up then and took issue. I said we possessed it. There spoke the race, he said always ready to claim what it hasn't got, and mistake its ounce of brass filings for a ton of gold dust. You have a mongrel perception of humor, nothing more. A multitude of you possess that. This multitude see the comic side of a thousand low-grade and trivial things, broad incongruities mainly, grotesqueries, absurdities, evokers of the horse-laugh the ten thousand high-grade comicalities which exist in the world are sealed from their dull vision. Will a day come when the race will detect the funniness of these juvenilities, and laugh at them, and by laughing at them destroy them? For your race in its poverty has unquestionably one really effective weapon. Laughter! Power, money, persuasion, supplication, persecution, these can lift at a colossal humbug, push it a little, weaken it a little, century by century, but only laughter can blow it to rags and atoms at a blast. 
Against the assault of laughter nothing can stand. You're always fussing and fighting with your other weapons. Do you ever use that one? No. You leave it lying, rusting. As a race, do you ever use it at all? No. You lack sense and the courage. We were traveling at the time and stopped at a little city in India and looked on while a juggler did his tricks before a group of natives. They were wonderful, but I knew Satan could beat that game, and I begged him to show off a little, and he said he would. He changed himself into a native in turban and breechcloth, and very considerately conferred on me a temporary knowledge of the language. The juggler exhibited a seed, covered it with earth in a small flower-pot, then put a rag over the pot. After a minute the rag began to rise. In ten minutes it had risen a foot. Then the rag was removed, and a little tree was exposed, with leaves upon it and ripe fruit. We ate the fruit, and it was good. But Satan said, Why do you cover the pot? Can't you grow the tree in sunlight? No, said the juggler. No one can do that. You are only an apprentice. You don't know your trade. Give me the seed. I will show you. He took the seed and said, What shall I raise from it? It is a cherry seed. Of course you will raise a cherry. Oh, no, that is a trifle. Any novice can do that. Shall I raise an orange tree from it? Oh, yes. And the juggler laughed. And shall I make it bear other fruits as well as oranges? If God wills, and they all laughed. Satan put the seed in the ground, put a handful of dust on it, and said, Rise! A tiny stem shot up and began to grow, and grew so fast that in five minutes it was a great tree, and we were sitting in the shade of it. There was a murmur of wonder. Then all looked up and saw a strange and pretty sight, for the branches were heavy with fruits of many kinds and colors, oranges, grapes, bananas, peaches, cherries, apricots, and so on. Baskets were brought, and the unlading of the tree began, and the people crowded around Satan and kissed his hand and praised him, calling him the Prince of Jugglers. The news went about the town, and everybody came running to see the wonder, and they remembered to bring baskets, too. But the tree was equal to the occasion. It put out new fruits as fast as any were removed. Baskets were filled by the score and by the hundred, but always the supply remained undiminished. At last a foreigner in white linen and sun helmet arrived and exclaimed angrily, Away from here! Clear out, you dogs! The tree is on my lands and is my property! The natives put down their baskets and made humble obeisance. Satan made humble obeisance, too, with his fingers to his forehead in the native way, and said, Please let them have their pleasure for an hour, sir, only that and no longer. Afterward you may forbid them, and you will still have more fruit than you and the state together can consume in a year. This made the foreigner very angry, and he cried out, Who are you, you vagabond, to tell your betters what they may do and what they mayn't? and he struck Satan with his cane and followed this error with a kick. The fruits rotted on the branches, and the leaves withered and fell. The foreigner gazed at the bare limbs with the look of one who is surprised and not gratified. Satan said, Take good care of the tree, for its health and yours are bound together. It will never bear again, but if you tend it well it will live long. Water its roots once in each hour every night, and do it yourself, it must not be done by proxy, and to do it in daylight will not answer. If you fail only once in any night, the tree will die, and you likewise. Do not go home to your own country any more. You would not reach there. Make no business or pleasure engagements which require you to go outside your gate at night. You cannot afford the risk. Do not rent or sell this place. It would be injudicious. The foreigner was proud and wouldn't beg, but I thought he looked as if he would like to. While he stood gazing at Satan, we vanished away and landed in Ceylon. I was sorry for that man. 
sorry satan hadn't been his customary self and killed him or made him a lunatic it would have been a mercy satan overheard the thought and said i would have done it but for his wife who has not offended me she is coming to him presently from their native land portugal she is well but has not long to live and has been yearning to see him and persuade him to go back with her next year she will die without knowing he can't leave that place he won't tell her he he will not trust that secret with any one he will reflect that it could be revealed in sleep in the hearing of some portuguese guest's servant some time or other did none of those natives understand what you said to him none of them understood but he will always be afraid that some of them did that fear will be torture to him for he has been a harsh master to them in his dreams he will imagine them chopping his tree down that will make his days uncomfortable i have already arranged for his nights it grieved me though not sharply to see him take such a malicious satisfaction in his plans for this foreigner does he believe what you told him satan he thought he didn't but our vanishing helped the tree where there had been no tree before that helped the insane and uncanny variety of fruits the sudden withering all these things are helps let him think as he may reason as he may one thing is certain he will water the tree but between this and night he will begin his changed career with a very natural precaution for him what is that he will fetch a priest to cast out the tree's devil <laughs> you are such a humorous race and don't suspect it will he tell the priest no he will say a juggler from bombay created it and that he wants the juggler's devil driven out of it so that it will thrive and be fruitful again the priest's incantations will fail then the portuguese will give up that scheme and get his watering pot ready mm. but the priest will burn the tree i know it he will not allow it to remain yes and anywhere in europe he would burn the man too but in india the people are civilized and these things will not happen the man will drive the priest away and take care of the tree i reflected a little then said satan you have given him a hard life i think comparatively it must not be mistaken for a holiday we flitted from place to place around the world as we had done before satan showing me a hundred wonders most of them reflecting in some way the weakness and triviality of our race he did this now every few days not out of malice i am sure of that it only seemed to amuse and interest him just as a naturalist might be amused and interested by a collection of ants. End chapter 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2008.